Yeah, this is uh, a talk um, that may be slightly autobiographical. Uh, so I call it conceptual issues in body temperature field theory. These were things that I was hung up on when I first started learning about body temperature field theory. Oh. I should have this on too. Uh, that had made me kind of look away and work on other things uh, while I was a grad student. And now that I've had some time and a little bit more experience, I've kind of come back to examine uh, some of these issues. And I think I've kind of I've made sense of how to think about finite temperature field theory in a to, to a certain level of satisfaction for myself. And so this could either be um, very new to some people. Uh, it could be very obvious to some people. I just know there's not a whole lot written in the philosophy literature. I don't think really anything uh, specific to finite temperature field theory. And so I just want to point out some of the differences uh, and why they're, they're not so much of a problem. So uh, as an outline, a little introduction, I'll tell you why finite temperature field theory is not OK. Uh, and by that, uh, not just that it's at finite temperature, but what, what these conceptual differences are, but why that's all right. Um, so that there's a certain way of thinking that I think is amenable to many people in this room, that kind of the way many of you might already think about quantum field theory, but maybe not all of you, um, that makes sense of, like, really helps unify these sets of pictures. And then I'll gesture towards some of my own kind of more controversial, <laughs> broader picture views on how to think about quantum field theory that may not, uh, that aren't necessary for making sense of finite temperature field theory, but that I think are compatible with that sort of view. Okay, so um, just briefly, again, like I said, not many people have talked about finite temperature field theory in philosophy. Uh, so you might wonder two questions. Uh, why should I focus on this? And even maybe more fundamentally, what is finite temperature field theory? I'm not gonna cover a lot of like thorough technical background. Just I, I, I know many of the people in this room know quite a bit about quantum field theories. So I'm just gonna highlight some of qualitative features here. So one thing about why study it, um, it's a major area of applied particle physics uh, that has not really been well studied, as I said. Um, it has ap applications in many areas, like astrophysics, cosmology, uh, terrestrial heavy ion collisions, we need to account for finite temperature. So it has applications and finds applications all over um, wherever we're using relativistic quantum field theories. And uh, so it's something that, you know, if we're paying attention to how physics is used, that's something we should maybe consider. Um, I think it sort of requires uh, a certain perspective on theory interpretation that, or, or it maybe doesn't require, it's much more amenable to a certain style of interpre uh, interpreting quantum field theory that may not be as obvious uh, in the vacuum case. Um, and just, uh, it's also kind of uh, looking at the sort of boundaries where quantum field theory general relativity meets if you look at the applications, um, and maybe uh, kind of looking at this sort of uh, beyond just the sort of vacuum of quantum field theory, can give like some insight into how we should think about or understand or approach uh, conceptual issues in quantum gravity as well. Um, so what is finite temperature field theory? I've already kind of hinted at this, subspecies of uh, relativistic quantum field theory. So non-relativistic quantum field theories in, that are used in condensed matter are already at finite temperatures. There's not the, the name in the physics literature typically refers to quantum, but relativistic quantum field theories. Um, but it's, yeah, it's a subspecies of quantum field theory that treat, uh, so therefore we're treating things as quantum fields, dealing with things like correlation functions, transport properties, uh, thermodynamic properties of those fields, um, importantly, where uh, background energies are high, uh, and therefore we have to include temperature in the description. Uh, what makes it finite temperature? Uh, but that it's, uh, where was it explicitly including temperature? Uh, we, the sort of standard ways of doing things, we look at, uh, we only choose a, a state, um, often for ordinary vacuum quantum field theory, the vacuum state is what's privileged, and then you do scattering uh, as excitations about the vacuum. Here you have excitations about thermal equilibrium state, usually. Um, yeah, so there's an explicit inclusion of temperature. Uh, there's, so it's, it's not like some super fundamental we're analyzing temperature in terms of the quantum fields that's kind of just treated as an extern or a control parameter. It's not like, um, we're, you know, you might think in some sort of conceptual sense at finite temperatures, well, what's causing that temperature background? It's high energy excitations of presumably things that could also be described as quantum fields. 
Um, we're not going that far into it, that would get enormously complicated. So the temperature is just kind of treated as a control parameter. Okay, so here's why it's not uh, okay. I couldn't find a thermometer picture that went high enough uh, to talk about the actual set of temperatures that would be relevant to the finding temperature field theory. Um, he's not in the picture. We get all these really weird schematics, but it's obviously much, much higher than you know, temperatures that we see outside. Um, but so one way that it's different um, that doing quantum field theory finding temperatures is different from vacuum quantum field theory is that we're dealing uh, with unitarily equivalent representations. Um, so there's a sort of clear way to think about this in the algebraic framework. You can also think about it outside of that, which I'll get to. Um, we often, you know, if we think about a quantum field theory as a sort of net of algebras over space time, or you know, local algebras over space time, we can kind of come into a Hilbert space representation via like the GMS construction sort of picture. That forces us to pick a state uh, and then uh, have the operators that act on that state, that privileged state is what helps define the Hilbert space. Um, you could choose a vacuum state, you could choose a thermal state, those are both perfectly allowable sort of states that you could choose to build around. Um, but in doing so, you get two different Hilbert spaces that are unitarily equivalent to one another. Um, so the thermal states are usually something like KMS state, or there's generalizations of those um, that uh, for, for sort of like a relativistic sort of invariant generalization. Those are, I haven't looked into that too much yet. But in the sort of ordinary case, it'll look something like this. Uh, your density of the rho, rho is just depending on beta and mu. Uh, this is just like thermal equilibrium state. Um, beta is inverse temperature, mu is a chemical potential. Um, I'm going to drop the mu and or whenever it comes up later, it's just that's kind of a general sort of form. Um, and so there's the fact that there's these unitarily equivalent representations means you don't just have some sort of straightforward translation between zero temperature and finite temperature. Um, so in the that, that's I'm, I'm not going into a whole lot of technical detail on these here. So if you want to ask, feel free to ask in the Q and A. But um, that's sort of one, one clear way of seeing the difference. You're dealing with unitarily equivalent representations. Um, you can deal with that sort of qualitative, thinking about this more qualitatively. Uh, often for vacuum quantum field theory, we're dealing with Fox spaces. So you have uh, you know, a tensor product of your zero particle, one particle, two particle, up to uh, n particle states. Um, and the privilege state being the vacuum state means that the expectation value of, that, of the number operator in that state is zero. Um, there's, uh, you can have expectations about that, but that's sort of the, the, the privileged state that you like build particles out of. Um, but in a thermal state, you have a finite particle density everywhere, and using the or ordinary sort of uh, infinite uh, space-time idealizations to think about our theories, that means the number operator diverges. So that's just another, uh, so you see here, if you have to use that state that I had on the last slide, and, uh, Take the expectation value of the number operator, you get infinity. Uh, this is just sort of a less formal way of saying that these are equivalent representations, um, but it's sort of a more physically intuitive way to think about that, maybe. Um, so the thermal state is just not a state in that sort of box space. Um, and again, just the same point again, just told in a slightly different way. Um, another way that they're different. Um, is that you get a sort of change in modeling strategy. Uh, we often think of vacuum quantum field theory as sort of dynamical evolution. Uh, you're looking at fields and the dynamics, you get equations of motion, things like that. Um, whereas for finite temperature field theory, at least for the most ordinary applications, um, you're dealing with excitations about equilibrium, which is a slightly different sort of modeling strategy. So uh, Mark Wilson has talked about this uh, in the physics avoidance book. Um, that we have these sorts of changes in modeling strategy, um, sometimes when, when modeling the details would be either difficult or impossible. And so this is one specifically that he talks about is a shift from dynamical modeling strategies to equilibrium modeling strategies to simplify the physics. So here's a, a case where you're doing that. Um, and one, one thing, uh, one mark of that is that you get external control parameters to uh, sort of tweak in your theories rather than thinking about temporal evolution. Um, so you're not taking a state, evolving it, seeing what comes out, you're dealing with expectations, usually at a single time, um, about equilibrium. And then you can, the, the changes that you make are sort of 
externally imposed and not modeled directly within the theory. Um, yeah, so this is just a bit more of that. So the dynamical strategy is kind of the standard one we think about uh, in foundation physics stuff. Uh, tracking the dynamical details of relevant degrees of freedom, the equations of motion. Um, you can set you set boundary conditions, uh, initial conditions, sometimes also final conditions. It can be spatial boundary conditions, whatever, and determine the evolution that goes on under those constraints. So that's like a scattering experiment in ordinary vacuum quantum field theory. You have an in state and an out state. Those are your sort of boundary conditions. You set up a path integral that you know, computes the uh, probability that you'll transition from that state to the, to the next. Um, it's often done, but not always, uh, in a sort of closed system sense. So we think of the system as being isolated, not interacting with other things, although you can generalize beyond, uh, beyond that. Um, but that's sort of typical of how we think about, um, quantum, about dynamical modeling strategies. So in the scattering picture, we don't, um, you know, we, we idealize often to you know, the, the particles scatter off to infinity when act in all actual it's sort of an idealization, but we're kind of treating the system as we bring the particles together, the system's isolated from everything else, we just treat those interactions, and then we measure what comes out. Um, one thing that Wilson brings up, this isn't super important, I guess, for the talk, uh, but um, there's a shift in what we mean by the, the, the word cause in uh, going from dynamical to uh, equilibrium modeling strategy. So here it's kind of got the Sort of ordinary way you probably think about cause, like a temporal process affecting change, so that you know something earlier happened in time causes something later in time. Um, yeah, the, the anyway, that's that's one way of thinking about it. Um, and this is sort of again the, the scattering picture in vacuum quantum field theory fits this largely this sort of approach. Maybe the, the cause talk isn't as relevant there, but um, I bring that up just because um, there's a there's an important difference in in cause here. Uh, when we're talking, talking about equilibrium modeling strategies. Um, so this case is where you kind of stop explicitly modeling time in the system. Um, you, you assume that whatever your system is has reached some sort of steady state, so that can be equilibrium state, it can be uh, like a you know, steady flow state in, in classical mechanics. Um, here it's going to be thermal equilibrium. Um, and then you describe sort of fluctuations about that steady state or like small changes to that steady state. You can describe just the properties of the state itself. Um, this is often uh, thought of more in a more open system way. So we have like temperature here as a control parameter. We can, we can go in uh, at least. So maybe there's some controversy thinking this in finite temperature field theory, but in other thermodynamic cases where temperature is kind of a control parameter, we can go in and change the temperature and see what happens. Um, and that affects sort of a different notion of cause here, which is why it's relevant of sort of intervention on these control parameters. When we say that you know, when in an ideal gas. Uh, changing the pressure causes, I'm uh, sorry, changing the volume causes the pressure to change. That's, we've, you know, it's had some external control, we've tweaked the control. We're not modeling time in here, so sometimes that can maybe get confusing. What we mean by cause, what we mean is a sort of controlled intervention. Um, and this is the sort of thing, for the most part, that is happening with finite temperature field theory. So again, different sort of modeling strategies that are going on. Um, the clearest way to see that, the sort of standard formalism for using, for doing finite temperature field theory is uh, the imaginary time formalism. Um, it's quite clear in, in this sort of formalism that you're not explicitly modeling time anymore. Um, there's sort of a formal transformation you can make uh, to go from expectation values, so once you fix the frame, expectation values uh, are the like evolution of the Hamiltonian in time. Uh, if you make a formal change of variables, you can change, go to imaginary time, and if you have uh, this delta T being equal to the inverse temperature, you now have you get this sort of formal transformation that takes you from a vacuum partition function to a thermal partition function. Um, and uh, one of the interesting things that's not super relevant here is you actually integrate over uh, periodic boundary conditions to model, because in going out, the states on either side are both the equilibrium states, so they have to kind of, you can strain them with the states of the same. Um, so yeah, this is a, just a clear way of seeing that you're not, you've gone from dynamical, like you can't really have a dynamical modeling strategy if you don't have time uh, modeled in, implicitly or explicitly. It's now become a temperature variable. So you're dealing with this sort of equilibrium <coughs> sort of approach. Uh, and this also works out nicely for formal reasons. So you, 
again, you can go on from time to temperature, but you also can go to equation path integral. Um, it's easier convergence property, nicer to work with. So this is, uh, there are real time formalisms for finite temperature field theory, but they're often, again, still doing equilibrium uh, sort of modeling, so that's, uh, doesn't exactly change this, but if this is used more frequently, just because it's also mathematically more convenient. Um, so, so yeah, you, you've got this sort of timeless sort of theory, but and so you might think, oh, well, that's pretty limited in what we can do with it. We can only maybe calculate properties of the equilibrium state or like small quantum fluctuations of the equilibrium state. Um, but there's actually a little bit more you can do with this formalism. Um, you can talk about uh, transport properties at finite temperature using what's called linear response theory, which I'll get to on the next slide. Um, so linear response theory is uh, it's used outside of the context of uh, finite temperature field theory as well, but it's a sort of modeling strategy that allows you to talk about small uh, deviations from equilibrium or changes from equilibrium um, as though you're just it's a natural fluctuation out of the equilibrium state. You can model the evolution, like if you if you've imposed, you know, you've you've, you've imposed an external uh, change on the system, you can model that as a fluctuation about equilibrium, and the sort of relaxing back to equilibrium, the dynamics will end up being the same as if you um, actually externally changed the system out of equilibrium, and will go back to the same way, at least to linear order, which is why this is linear uh, response theory. So yeah, you model sort of small controlled departures from equilibrium. Um, Bob Adderman has been talk recently started talking about this quite a bit in his new book. Uh, it's a form of like a, something like fluctuation dissipation theorem is what he calls it. Uh, this sort of class of, of theorems that kind of show that, that you, you can use this sort of modeling strategy. Um, so yeah, the system's response to an external disturbance is the same uh, as its response to it sort of spontaneous fluctuation away from equilibrium. So in uh, finite temperature field theory, uh, this complicated expression is uh, kind of how, how you model these sorts, sorts of things. So why is the observable you're interested in? The change in its uh, equilibrium, so the, the, the brackets here with respect to the thermal state, so the change in its thermal, uh, the expectation value from, about the thermal state um, under like a linear response um, is equal to the trace of the thermal, that thermal state. Uh, and then there's a commutator between this, what's called the external Hamiltonian and the, uh, the observable itself, uh, and you, you kind of integrate that over a, a period of time. The external Hamiltonian is what you use to model the, the push you give the system away from equilibrium. So it's just a, the reason it's time controlled is between uh, you sort of turn on that uh, that, that sort of external uh, like push, and then you turn it off and see how the system relaxes back. And you see how it changes those values and see how that kind of then those values change as it relaxes back to equilibrium. Um, so that's another thing that you can do uh, with finite temperature field theory. Again, quite a bit different. Um, we're not, this is not something you often see uh, in sort of vacuum, the sort of stereotypical, the prototypical, I guess, uh, scattering experiments that we do in sort of ordinary vacuum quantum field theory. But I basically said the same uh, There's small changes in time, there's no explicit modeling of temporal resolution. Uh, in the overall theory, you have this uh, integration variable of a T prime, um, which is just uh, parameterizes the, uh, the amount of time that the Hamiltonian can turn on. Um, but in the sort of overall piece, you put this back into a formalism that's still talking about fluctuations of <laughs> equilibrium states. So I've talked about a couple of formal changes already. So the thinking about the dynamics to equilibrium sort of modeling strategies, moving to imaginary time, dealing with fluctuations about thermal states. Um, a couple other big differences is that there's no scattering amplitudes. Uh, you don't have a scattering picture in finite temperature field theory. And it's not, um, finite temperature field theory is not manifestly Lorentz uh, invariant or covariant for obvious reasons that I'll get to. Um, so the big thing that may surprise you or it surprised me when I first started thinking about finite temperature field theory is that there is no scattering picture. Um, we think, you know, it, at least at a sort of introductory level to quantum field theory, almost everything you ever calculate are scattering amplitudes. Um, 
sort of move to this application where, look, we actually don't, you know, we don't even have a scattering picture, we don't have okay scattering amplitudes. Um, the, the thing, the reason why you don't have it is, is that the S matrix and the interaction picture depends on modulo issues with at the foundation, just like Hogg's theorem or, or things like that. Um, uh, it depends on particles sort of come, starting out at a, you know, an infinite time away from each other, not interacting, coming together, interacting, and then scattering off and being far enough apart where you can turn the interactions off at an infinite time <coughs> in the future. Um, you can't do that in finite temperature field theory because there's sort of a finite background particle density everywhere. There is no uh, asymptotic infinities in either direction where you could even set up a, a picture where the, the particles are treated as free states, even in the sort of messy way we do it in Lagrangian quantum field theory, uh, you, you still can't get that done, so you just can't even uh, get enough matrix sort of treatment off of it. Okay, so uh, also, the topic, I think this is, uh, yeah, the, the last sort of formal change I'll mention, um, you can't really do finite temperature field theory in a Lorentz invariant way. Temperature is a sort of a frame uh, dependent quantity, um, you, you, in order to, to use the, something like the imaginary time formalism that I brought up, you have to fix a frame, separate time from space, transform the time variable, and keep the space ones the same. Um, so, in a, in a sort of classical context, you can talk, Eugene Todd talks about uh, how temperature is not sort of Lorentz invariant, how there's different sort of definitions, but it's, uh, anyway, it's, that's, it's kind of obvious in a certain sense if you think of you know, the heuristic of temperature being something that can mean kinetic energy, if you boost, that, that's going to change a bit. Um, yeah, so, so yeah, you, you kind of, you have to fix a reference frame in order to use finite temperature field theory. And so, in some sense, it's um, you're kind of limiting yourself to thinking about systems where you can, where there's sort of a privileged frame of reference that you can define to talk about temperature. Um, so I think, uh, Maybe not for people in this room, uh, at least not some of the people in this room for sure, um, but for some people or for some more uh, classical views, I guess, <laughs> sounds weird to call them that, but they, the way that pe people talked about quantum field theory uh, maybe 15, 20 years ago, um, this sort of thinking about finite temperature field theory forces a sort of different perspective on you. Um, you don't have a sort of, uh, you're not thinking about manifestly uh, relativistic, like it is relativistic, but it's not manifestly relativistic system. You're not dealing with temporal evolution, you're not dealing with closed systems. Um, so, so the sort of picture that you get maybe from just interpreting a, the sort of vacuum quantum field theory quite literally, uh, taking the, the internal idealizations like Mopola, we're talking about a whole universe that's described with these sort of fundamental interactions. Um, that sort of picture, I, I think it's wrong for other reasons, but it's definitely not even available here. You can't, you can't think about oh, what if I take finite temperature field theory and think of the universe as this way? You get some, I mean, I guess you could, but you get something that's just obviously wrong. But there's a preferred reference frame, a preferred background temperature, and all that sort of stuff. Um, also, uh, so, so this is sort of a way of when you start to think about vacuum quantum field theory as like a candidate fundamental theory or something like that. Um, one, one thing that confused me at first, because I, so again, uh, autobiographically, that's coming into philosophy of quantum field theory, that's kind of the way I thought about things, was we should treat these things as candidate fundamental theories that are applicable to the universe as a whole. Um, and that, that really confused me for finite temperature field theory because I'm like, we're, we're just sort of throwing temperature and sort of phenomenologically, what are we coupling the universe to? Like, where's the heat path and all this sort of stuff? Um, you can't, so I think it, it, the, the obvious answer to that now that I've, uh, I'm a little more mature is, is that uh, that was just the wrong way of thinking of, of approaching, uh, interpreting the quantum field theory altogether. So I think this, um, again, one of the use, uses of thinking about finite temperature field theory is that it sort of forces you to take a different perspective that you might, or that I at least then kind of stated in, uh, in the past. Um, so I think this is sort of one of the general lessons. Uh, the, the terminology open system modeling comes from a paper by Mike Kafaro and Svan Hartman, but that's not super important. It's just um, being explicitly aware of the, app the applications of the theory. We, we acknowledge that, you know, there's, even if we don't model it explicitly, there's always sort of a system environment split whenever we're doing uh, particle physics. We treat a system, whether we idealize to infinite boundary conditions, whether we put it in a box, you know, we're actually we're treating a subsystem of the world. 
um, and we should acknowledge that sort of system environment split. Um, in a sort of open systems modeling approach, or some, uh, also with the equilibrium modeling that might fit under here, uh, the boundary conditions or control variables uh, sort of parameterize the boundary, like how we how we separated the system from its uh, environment and how we then intervene on that system. Um, that so, yeah, they have a point. This is closer to uh, explanatory end of science, like it makes sense to do science instead of uh, thinking about open systems as being somehow more primary. This is a better way of doing it. I at least think it applies epistemically. That's how we access the world is through investigating subsystems and isolating them and testing them. Um, I'm not as committed to this explanatory thing. So I just kind of read that paper. They also think it's more ontologically fundamental. I don't. I don't have a thought. On that. Any thoughts on that, but at least it's a sort of different perspective than you might take from you know treating the theory as though there's a there's a universe which is described specifically by this Lagrangian uh, and, and and kind of going from there. And yeah, so so again that so there's this open system, closed system, however you want to say it. There's you can't take that sort of approach uh, with for all these reasons. You just don't really get a, a closed system version of finite temperature field theory. And I don't think you should really want one, um, is kind of the point I'm going to get to here. So those are the big, the big differences that you might see, uh, at least you know, formally and in terms of how you, uh, the options you have for interpreting uh, between uh, vacuum quantum field theory and finite temperature field theory. Um, but, you know, that's, like I said, I think that's all right. Um, so I'm going to try to gesture towards what I think are some ways to kind of have a unified understanding of how uh, to think about both vacuum and finite temperature field theory as just applications uh, of, of a, you know, different representations and applications of, of a specific sort of uh, quantum field theory. So I've talked about this already, but uh, sort of one, one option you might have had if you, if you were really committed to what I at least autobiographically said was my sort of naive view, um, is you might say, uh, look, maybe finite temperature field theory is just outside. Like, if that's an application, sort of we shouldn't really pay much attention to that. It's not, it's not even a candidate for a foundational approach. It's vacuum quantum field theory, and the temperature just sort of emerges on that. Um, I think there's good reasons that you shouldn't take that view. Uh, there's a lot of success, successful applications of finite temperature field theory uh, that are empirically well confirmed. Um, and I think generally that philosophers ought to engage with theories uh, on these sorts of terms, like how they're actually applied, the way that scientists use them, rather than um, thinking of them as sort of static, abstract objects. Um, and so if you want to engage with the successes of applications of quantum field theory generally, you have to talk about finite temperature field theory. And that involves like, ne necessarily engaging with thinking about different modeling strategies for, for quantum field theory. Um, and like I said, I felt already gestured towards this, that the differences um, that come up are really only uh, prob problems for certain types of interpretive uh, approaches to quantum field theory, or to theories generally. And I think this, the, the lessons kind of should generalize and apply to how we think about all theories, but specifically for quantum field theory. Um, and I think it's also important, uh, again, to see how, to look at the sort of boundaries and how our, our you know, clean, uh, easily interpretable parts of theories, comparatively easily interpretable parts of theories, are actually applied and how they interact with other theories. So this comes up, um, David's talked about this, Porter's talked about this, how we think about um, how, you know, how our theories link up with other theories in the world, how, they, how we sort of come up with hybrids. So um, I'm not sure if David would use these terms exactly, but you know, that the sort of astrophysical applications and the, the uh, cosmological applications Kind of show us how we can link up quantum field theory with general relativity in certain ways. I know I think you would probably say that's just one theory, but um, we have ways to link, you know, it, in some sense we're linking up the two theories that we already have in, in a sort of new application. And I think it's important uh, to think about how that happens and that we get new important philosophical insights for how to interpret the theories uh, that we currently have um, sort of in, in those areas of overlap. Um, so some applications of uh, finite temperature field theory uh, that I've, I've just gestured towards um, kind of in, in order of increasing 
speculativity, I know, <laughs> speculation. Uh, so first is heavy ion collisions. Um, these are things that we can do at like things like Slack. We can combine uh, like the nucleus of larger ion um, atoms together and see what comes out. The energy scales in the background, so thermal properties require that the, the temperatures are actually relevant. Uh, you can't ignore them like you can for other scattering uh, processes. Um, but the binding properties of nuclei are also really important. There's uh, high temperature effects that contribute to the binding energy of large atoms that are uh, not negligible, I think they're on the order of a few percent. Um, how we model neutron stars, white dwarfs, other compact um, like astrophysical objects depends on this. Um, the temperatures inside of a star are warm enough where if you're trying to do any sort of quark physics calculations, you kind of need to take those into account. Um, we also think that finite temperature effects are relevant for things for phase transitions, as David will talk about quite a bit more. Um, so ones uh, lower energy ones being like the quark gluon plasma transition, where uh, hadrons break apart and quarks kind of flow freely. Uh, quarks and gluons flow freely. Uh, there's also a little bit more speculative ideas about uh, analogies with um, condensed matter physics stuff of having superconductivity in the color charge rather than just on the electromagnetic charge. Um, that's that's more speculative. And then at the, the, the more remote parts, I think about early universe phase transitions, like the, oh, I mean, quark gluon plasma kind of fits depending on how early you mean by the early universe, but electroweak, maybe grand unified theories, uh, inflationary phase transitions, things like that. Um, there's some theoretical talk about kind of temperature effects being responsible for baryon number non-conservation, but those are, those are a bit more speculative. Um, so these two, at least I would say, well, definitely the first one, predictions have been tested and confirmed. We can go and collide things. We can measure properties of the yet. Um, this is a little bit more indirect, but no more indirect than other astrophysical sort of tests and observations. In order to model the stars and have the properties that we think they, need, they should have, uh, that we observe them to have, then we need to take account of the temperature effects. Uh, I think we have good reasons to expect these are both true as well. I just mean, if, if you're wanting to be very skeptical about the applications, these are the ones that are very well confirmed. Um, so I think one way to think about um, that, that there's kind of there's a bit of an open question here that I'd be happy, happy to get some feedback on, but I think the sort of obvious uh, maybe first approach to think about how we should make sense of the relationships between vacuum quantum field theory and finite temperature field theory is that they're just distinct modes of representation of the sort of the same underlying dynamical models. Um, so in the sort of cleaning algebraic approach, you have the same algebra of observables, uh, and you're just choosing different Hilbert space representations based on different states, and maybe you get different properties, they're unitarily equivalent, but that's fine. We know that that comes up all the time in quantum field theory. I think there's a, you could tell something of a similar story, not in the algebraic case, it's just a little less cleaner, and I'm not exactly sure how to spell out um, what the, the content is that's the same <laughs> in both. So but one thing that comes out of this is that neither of these is like, a, it's not like quantum, vacuum quantum field theory is the privileged one, or finite temperature is the privileged one, that, that that one's somehow more special. The other is parasitic on it, or a special case of it. Um, they're just diff distinct representations. Um, yeah, making this precise is kind of challenging because you can't. So one, the obvious case would be to say, oh look, we, we choose, a, you know, we have a Lagrangian or maybe a path integral, and then that that is the real physics, and then we, we choose which states uh, to quantize around. But there's a lot of flexibility uh, in quantum field theory for redefining the fields. There's equivalences between Lagrangians, and we're not exactly sure um, how to spell out to make precise what the physical what what object we should think of as containing the physical information, and and then you know, kind of choosing distinct representations of that. But I think at a, at a sort of hand where you do level, that's kind of what's going on. Um, so yeah, there's, there's some more distinguishing, well, how do you individuate quantum field theories, which I think is kind of a general problem if we're working in the sort of Lagrangian picture. Yeah, and so I've kind of said this, I've gestured towards this already. Um, finite temperature, so I said one's not more fundamental than the other. You'll sometimes see uh, gestures towards the idea that finite temperature field theory is much more general, uh, in that the zero temperature is just a special case. Um, and I think that's right in some sense. Like if uh, you take beta to infinity and all the formal expressions, uh, you get something like a vacuum generating functional out. 
Inversion of temperature to infinity means temperature to zero. So it's like there's a formal equivalence there. But I think um, at the level of how you think about these theories, uh, or other than these representations of the same theories, um, we shouldn't think about that as like, oh, finite temperature is more fundamental than zero temperature is just a special case. Um, again, we have different Hilbert space representations, but I think that the difference in perspective is more important. Um, in some sense, finite temperature field theory is more, more general, it deals with more temperatures, but it also forces you to fix a reference frame, it forces you to do away with the scattering picture. So there's certain things that, uh, depending on what, you're starting, what you want as a starting point, you might take one as, as uh, kind of the, the natural place to go. So vacuum pump field theory, I think, is just as fundamental if the, I mean, talk of fundamentality is a little bit confusing, but I don't think one is sort of more encompassing or a general case than the other. Again, it's better to think about like, different modeling strategies uh, applied to different problems. Um, I think this is how we should think about quantum field theory sort of generally. It's a model that we, like I was gesturing towards with this sort of open systems view and paying attention to the system environment split, that we should think of quantum field theory as a sort of modeling framework generally. Um, it supplies concepts, mathematics, like certain tools, uh, certain um, rules for how to, how to calculate things, um, within which we can construct more specific theories or models, uh, dynamical, phenomenological, whatever. And we can think of finite temperature field theory and vacuum quantum field theory as prescriptions, different sort of prescriptions for framework level modeling that you can then fill in uh, with the specific dynamical details you need. Um, but you choose finite temperature when you're dealing with subsystems where the, the, temp the, the temperature is not negligible and that'll actually have dynamical effect and where there's a natural way to sort of privilege a uh, sort of fixed reference frame and actually define a temperature for the system. Um, yeah. Um, so there, there's also this sort of sense, again, this is, we gestured a bit uh, in the first day about what the ontology of quantum field theory is, is it particles, fields, whatever. Um, I don't have an answer to that. I do have a way of saying that um, finite temperature field theory and vacuum and quantum field theory give you different particle notions um, because what we do when we're talking about particles in quantum field theories, at least in the Lagrangian sense, is where uh, there's sort of whatever the elementary excitations are about the background state we're considering. We have different background states that have widely different properties, a thermal state versus a vacuum state. We're going to have, in general, not always, but in general, different uh, non uh, translatable or non directly translatable notions of what those elementary excitations are. Um, so, yeah, you can't, you can't. You definitely can't have a unitary transformation between them, but maybe you can, you know. Uh, the, the obvious cases are when we think about phase transitions here. So if you think about um, like the, the Higgs mechanism, if you're in a state of really high temperature, the, uh, the, the, the effective potential changes, the ground state is the one uh, where the symmetry is restored. You have four massless vector bosons, um, and you know, that that's sort of this, this sort of electronic unification there. Once the symmetry breaks, you now have, it's not that three of those bosons have gained a mass and one has stayed massless. They kind of mix up. The degrees of freedom aren't, aren't uh, the same anymore. The, the elementary excitations are, are combinations of those initial fields. Um, so it kind of confuses the ontology a little bit here too. So you, you uh, whatever, you know, if insofar as quantum field theories should be talked about as having particle ontologies, um, you're going to get different ones in general uh, when you're talking about finite temperatures or when you're talking about zero temperatures, even for the same sort of background theory. Um, yes, this, uh, I think this isn't super important to my points here, so I'm running low on time. I'm going to skip it. There's just tools from other fields that come in. I think that's a general thing about, about any sort of area of applied physics that we bring in methods um, from other, uh, or that we've learned to bring in methods from other areas of physics to solve problems. So, uh, so I'm just going to quick go. You can ask about that later if you want. Um, so here's sort of my uh, punchline. How should we understand quantum field theory uh, in light of its finite temperature applications? I think if we want a sort of consistent unified picture, we should think of quantum field theory as a sort of framework, a modeling framework, paying attention to how it's applied. Um, and the systems that we model. Um, there's a set, 
I'm anticipating probably a question from at least a few of you. What those applications in the early universe? Is that a subsystem? Um, sort of, sort of not. Uh, there is at least a way to pick a preferred frame there. We can talk about whether we should think about it as a subsystem or not in the Q&A. I think we should. Um, I know that it might be controversial for some. Um, and so again, borrowing from Mark Wilson, this moves us away from the theory P style reasoning, as he calls it, for quantum field theory. Um, not just thinking about a clean uh, sort of sheer mathematical formalism that we then go and interpret, uh, paying attention to the approximation techniques, uh, other things that are relevant for applying um, the, the theories in different situations to model different contexts and get predictions. That's actually really informative of what the content of the theory is, um, and we shouldn't ignore that. I think this is also a way, so Laura Ricci, um, and I'm sure many of you have read her book, Interpreting Quantum Theories, she advocates for a kind of similar pragmatic context-dependent uh, sort of view. I think uh, this sort of case justifies that sort of approach, but out, outside of the limited context of uh, algebraic quantum field theory, where she's looking at it more uh, in that book. Um, and then I have my, my really speculative one, which I'll probably skip because <laughs> I'm running out of time, is that I think this sort of leads us away or out of a sort of thinking of physics as modeling the universe as a whole, and that we have to really think of ourselves as a, 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 it's fundamental that we separate things into subsystems and an environment, and that I don't think there's a way out of that, but that has really has nothing to do with the, I mean, it's consistent with the rest of this stuff, and I think it, it's helpful, it helps me understand this, but that's not something that's forced upon you. Um, okay, so I already talked about the modeling framework stuff. Uh, one thing I want to highlight, since there's been a lot of talk about effective field theory, uh, that this is all compatible and consistent with thinking about quantum field theories as, as effective field theories um, in any sort of level of generality that you want. But I don't think it's, you don't have to think about it in that way, you, even if you want to think, oh, I mean, I think it's hard to think about, we should pay attention to applications and not think about things as an effective field theory. But it, anyway, I think that they're kind of separable, but it's definitely compatible with the sort of effective field theory view. Um, so to talk quickly about uh, Laura's view, um, she thinks that, uh, and, and this is kind of, I'm just boring because she probably said it better than I can, and I'm just kind of translating into or outside of the context of algebraic quantum field theory. So she has this view um, that quantum field theories, uh, infinite quantum theories, along with all other theories, I think she thinks uh, should be interpreted in different ways in different contexts uh, of application. We don't have some sort of fixed universal interpretation. Uh, in particular, this means that we can interpret the specific resources that a theory gives us in different ways in different contexts. Some of them we privilege in some uh, contexts and others in others. Um, and not all, not all those resources will even be necessary for certain contexts. You, you, don't, you shouldn't have an interpretation that depends crucially on, on one of these uh, theoretical resources. Um, so in her case, she often she talks about, uh, <coughs> in the context of algebraic quantum field theory, uh, the algebraic structure or the Hilbert space structure and whether we should pick one or the other. Um, there's a Hilbert space conservatism, as she calls it, and algebraic imperialism, which says both of these will miss important um, context of application, and I think your, your interpretation should be more flexible. I completely agree with all of that, but I think, uh, again, the book that uh, there, she talks specifically about these sort of, these debating views, in, in, specifically in the context of algebraic quantum field theory. I think finite temperature field theory uh, case helps us move beyond that. We can think, look, we have different case contexts of application. Sometimes, uh, you know, scattering pictures is really, really important, and that's central to a lot of what we do, but it's not the only thing. If you have uh, a, a sort of interpretation that really leans heavily on those resources, you should kind of look over to finite temperature field theory, but that's not even applicable. And vice versa, where we think about equilibrium modeling strategies that we wouldn't use in vacuum cases. I think, again, we should be flexible in the context of application of the theory uh, for how we choose to interpret it. Um, so one thing that I'll just quickly gesture towards my controversial bit, <laughs> um, that I think uh, there's, there's often, I think, usually talk more from the relativity side of things that we should think about us living, you know, we should think about us living in a four-dimensional universe, you know, it's a block universe picture. Um, well, I think that's compatible and explanatory in a lot of, a lot of ways. I think it kind of um, can lead to some metaphysical confusions. I think as we're agents that are embedded in that four-dimensional space, 
um, we don't get to stand outside of it and see it as a, as a whole. Um, and I think the way we apply science is to, you know, being in that space, we often look at temporal evolution um, and, you know, boundary conditions and things like that are being very important in how we model systems and therefore how we interpret them. Um, yeah, early universe cosmology, like I said before, I think uh, there we have a, an interesting case where we're, we are sort of, or, well, the system, we're, we're describing the universe as a whole, but um, in, in some sense, the spatial totality of it, but the degrees of freedom that we're considering are not all of the degrees of freedom in the early universe. We're considering large scale degrees of freedom that then you know, are observable now. Um, but you know, we, can, we can come back and we can extrapolate backwards and see them. Uh, so there's a lot of fine grained detail that's being omitted. I think we can kind of treat, I'm not exactly sure how to make that precise, but I think we can kind of treat that as the, the lower scale degrees of freedom as the sort of um, bits that were omitted. Yeah, this just continues on that, that where, you know, when we think, if one uh, consequence of thinking about understanding theories as in terms of how we use them, uh, the modeling strategies that come with them, that, that forces us to think of uh, them as being inherently embedded in the world. You know? Which is kind of what I already said. I think there's some there's some evidence from elsewhere quantitatively that justifies this. So things like uh, perspective, of, like what we, how we interact with the background state uh, determines what sort of particle content we see, what our measurements will be. So we talk about that with different temperatures giving you different elementary excitation, different ways of moving through what we think of as the vacuum will give you, you know, thermal effects. So that's the under effect. Um, effective potentials change depending on you know the energy at which you're probing the system. So there's lots of um, insight that we should think about uh, these sorts of things as really responding to how we interact with them and, and, and our interactions with, with quantum field theoretic systems being really important. Okay, so I'm just finishing up. Uh, I'll just conclude with the sort of main uh, takeaways, the differences between finite temperature field theory and vacuum quantum field theory that I went over. We have inequivalent representations. We go from a sort of dynamical modeling strategy to an equilibrium modeling strategy. Um, there's a bunch of other, a couple other formal changes, like going to uh, Euclidean path integrals, measuring time, et cetera, et cetera. It's hard to think about finite temperature systems as closed systems uh, because we have this sort of temperature as an external kind of control uh, parameter. But we shouldn't really worry about these differences too much if we think about quantum field theories the right way. Um, we're kind of forced to think about them in a certain way if we want to pay attention to the success of applications. And I think that leads to content and modeling strategies, application sensitive interpretations, and prioritizing uh, thinking about systems as subsystems and with, with appropriate boundary conditions and how we interact. Uh, thanks. OK, no we have uh, David and Carlo, and then I'll come to Alex. Go ahead, David. Thank you. So I want to worry about the dynamics versus the equilibrium description. Um, I, I mean, that, that's the bit I'm not seeing. Maybe the rest I thought was, was great. I, I mean, here's the concern. The paradigm of dynamics in a field theory is at some early time, I have some state which is describable as a localized excitation of my background state. And then at some later time, I want to analyze the, the state as a superposition of or thermal mixture or whatever of, of, um, of, of, of excitations of that kind. And I can do that in th finite temperature field theory at the conceptual level just as straightforwardly as I can in zero temperature. In both cases I'm doing it, I'm going to need to calculate uh, endpoint functions of different times. But nothing stops me doing that in the finite temperature framework. The, 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 in both cases, in fact, that normally I end up with a partition function where time is imaginary, but in both cases I can wick rotate and analytically continue and get finite time components. So I'm really not seeing where the difference lies. I mean, it's true that in the zero temperature case, there's a convenient idealized limit where I take thing, take t, t to plus or minus infinity and get a scattering picture. And that doesn't exist in the, the thermal case. But you know, we can distinguish that from the idea that, 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 that I can't use the thermal situation perfectly well to describe finite time dynamics. So, so I have a, a potential answer, but it also might just be, again, I started autobiographically with me being confused about finite temperature field theory. There might be bits that I'm still a bit confused about, so I'm willing to, to maybe concede that. I think 
at least conceptually, the one thing that hang, I get hung up on when we think about, um, yes, you're right, we have imaginary time in both, and the analytically continue back. Um, but it's, so we don't have imaginary time in the vacuum case playing the role of a different variable, right? So, so we have it playing, and, and this is this, again, maybe there's more flexibility in this framework than, than I can, uh, than I know of right now, but I think that the thing that hangs me up on that is we turn time into temperature, and now I understand, okay, we're in a thermal state, and then we turn it back into time, and then where did the temperature go? But I, but I don't think we are turning time into temperature. That's a place I'd want to slightly disagree. Okay. I think that we're doing our, we're doing a Euclidean path integral, and our time is imaginary. It's just that we're doing it with periodic boundary conditions where the period is, te is inverse temperature. But that doesn't, make, that doesn't make an imaginary time temperature. I mean, I, I, think, I think trying to get a physical interpretation of that path integral is not trivial, but um, in, in any case, I mean, it, like, in a sense it can't be temperature because the system's temperature doesn't vary. It's not that I'm integrating over paths where the system's temperature moves smoothly from zero to T and back again. Um, it's just imaginary time. Okay, yeah, so, so again, maybe there's a little bit more similarity there than, than um, I've, I've emphasized. I do think uh, the sort of, if, if, I'm not sure I want to concede yet, I'd have to think more about it, but assuming that I am conceding you to, to your point, I think there is still at least the point that we have an equilibrium modeling strategy in one and we don't in the other, even if we're not talking about equilibrium at zero temperature, right? Vacuums at equilibrium. I want to study the properties of the vacuum, there's lots going on there. Okay, fair enough. Yeah, let me, let me think about sure. it, and we can chat later. Cool. Uh, Carlo. Um, yes, um, overall, let me say this. Um, in the first half of your talk, when you emphasize the differences, uh, inside myself, I was sort of bubbling and saying, no, come on, I mean, what is he saying? Could and, you and, just get more into the mic? And, and in the second half of the talk, uh, you corrected all the things I was complaining about. <laughs> Um, and yes, and uh, um, so I very much agree with your overall uh, uh, take of the things about the, the unity, and also I very much uh, agree with it. Um, all, all the comments at the end that you you you, you made more general, um, uh, including what you said about block universe and about seeing the systems um, we describe always as a, a part of the universe. Um, I would say you didn't go far enough. I mean, there's more to say. First of all, um, one of the two things I wanted to say is exactly what David, say, so David said, so I agree entirely. Um, the fact that uh, uh, statistics of inequilibrium is given by uh, e to the minus beta h in the, in the uh, canonical uh, has nothing to do with beta being a time, uh, uh, sort of imaginary time. It's just uh, there is a there is an ana, an, an analogy uh, between the, 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 the same expression in quantum theory with a, with a nine, which is a, which which is an analogy that allows sort of calculation to be done and sort of similarity of calculations. And let's sort of conf, confuse this with the fact that in both cases the, the, the evolution is given in the quantum theory with the i. But let me talk. This is the other thing I want to say, which is uh, Lorentz invariance. You seem to be puzzled about Lorentz invariance. Um, but it seems to me that a lot, a lot of, of the relation between um, so quantum field theory, zero temperature quantum field theory at, 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 at finite temperature, is just completely clarified by asking the same things in the classical theory. Um, we do understand quite well uh, the relation between the mechanics, the dynamics of the particles bouncing around, and the mechanics of the same things when there is an energy uh, a total energy, and we have given enough time to thermalize that, and they were either a box or a sufficient particle to thermalize. And it's exactly the same in the in the quantum uh, theory. In particular, of course, the dynamical theory of particles, uh, say free particles in Minkowski, is Lorentz invariant. And uh, of course, uh, if there are no particles, this is a Lorentz invariant state. And of course, if there are a certain number of particles, it's not anymore a Lorentz invariant state, because the particles themselves, with their motion, fix a frame. And of course, if they are thermalized, themselves fix the frame of the uh, set of mass of them. And so, um, the, the same happening in quantum field theory. It's Lorentz 
uh, seem it's not broken by the fact that there are boundary conditions or, or an observer, observer or anything like that. It's broken by the fact that, uh, I, I don't know, if you have a nebula uh, in the universe with a certain temperature, it picks a frame. Yeah. Exactly yeah. for the same region that your planet picks a frame. Um, so, uh, all together, it seems to me that the relation between the quantum field theory and the uh, quantum theory of thermal time is far more mysterious than what you may look at. They're just the, the same theory in studying different states. And the specific, uh, I'll just close, the specific uh, technical issues that come out from the fact that you go outside the Hilbert space and things like that, uh, um, seems to me the kind of things that are really technical issues, devoided by any deep significance. I mean, the reason you cannot do a Hilbert space is because you want to do the thermodynamic limit, because that's where it's easier to do calculation. So if you want to do the thermodynamic limit, you take your space to be infinity, which of course doesn't describe anything real, because there's nothing in infinity. Uh, and and, and the, the fact you go outside the, 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 the Hilbert space is just that, nothing else. Oh. There's an infinite number of particles, but you don't have an infinite number of particles per meter cube, of course, which is what you, what you actually describe it. So it's not that these things are not interesting, but they are not conceptually, philosophically interesting to me, or just technically to be dealt in the best yeah, possible. So I have a couple of things to say. The first, um, so I didn't want to mean that I was puzzled by the, I think it's quite obvious when you, when you pay attention to the context of application, that the system you're talking about picks out a preferred frame. Um, maybe as a bit of a straw man sort of position that you might be confused about that if you think of finite temperature field theory as needing to be some sort of fundamental observer dependent sort of approach, but I don't think anyone's really ever thought of it that way. So, so if I portrayed that I was confused about that, but I, I'm not. <laughs> Good. Um, the technical problems, I, so I agree and I think, I just want to make this sort of general, more general point that um, when I, I, I preface the talk by saying some of these things will be obvious to at least some of you in the room. I don't know if I explicitly looked at this particular direction, but I assumed it would come from roughly this area over here where these things would be explicitly obvious. Um, autobiographically, um, and perhaps in the philosophical literature as well, um, there is a lot of concern about some of these, these technical issues and how do we physically interpret them. And I think, again, it's maybe not particularly novel or, or exciting to you, but I think thinking about theories in the way that I was kind of talking about is gives you a principled way of saying why we shouldn't be worried about those things uh, generally, not just on a case-by-case on -case basis. Uh, but yeah, I, I, I agree that that maybe not as mysterious uh, if, if you've already kind of adopted something like this view. Yeah. Oh. Yes, so thank you. Um, <clears throat> this maybe a, um, yeah, latches on to what, uh, um, what Carl was mentioning about the relation, like a similar relation in the classical theory I just wanted to ask, this is maybe not a, a well-formed question, um, but so what, what makes, say, the relation between, or does anything make the relation between zero temperature QFT and finite temperature field theory different from similar relations in other theories? Or, yeah, or, um, or why do we consider something like finite temperature field theory like a whole, um, a whole thing of its own while we don't talk at least about finite temperature, other kind of theory. So what, it, what, what makes that relation special in the QFT case? We just see certain things more clearly or the qualitative differences. So yeah, that was my. Yeah, so I think one of the things uh, kind of similar to what Carlo just said is that potentially if you have a good understanding of, of how things are going on conceptually, it's not all that different, but the, the machinery, like the machinery of ordinary vacuum quantum field theory is pretty complex and then generalizing that to finite temperature cases. Uh, so I actually have a paper somewhere that isn't available yet uh, on the sort of history of the development of these methods for thinking about phase transitions in the early universe. Um, and at least historically they were, uh, you know, it took quite a bit of time where you had to go into, which we, things we use now and are kind of taught, but like functional integral methods and dealing with different non-perturbative expressions for like an effective action. Um, and, and in those cases you can kind of bring in uh, temperature effects more naturally than you can um, in other ways. Uh, so my so I can't speak for uh, for any for everybody, but I think that yeah, the conceptual my I think the the takeaway from this talk is that the conceptual differences 
are, are quite minor and not super important, and we should think of, uh, you know, the, they, I, the, the differences are mostly technical and detail, and uh, they're only conceptually really confusing if you have a particular way of thinking about how we should interpret quantum field theory. Um, as for the why, there's tech, you know, we have, there's textbooks called finite temperature field theory, not, and um, again, I think that's just more because the tech, the actual, like, calculational machinery um, is a bit more complicated. I think the reading that Yeah, so just to the uh, question, um, to the question of the classical counterpart of what's going on here, um, I think there was one, um, and it's like Duhan thinking about like friction and temperature and how you model mechanically and thermodynamically certain effects. So actually one of the chapters of that Mark Wilson book, the physics avoidance book is about, it's a very long chapter about that historical episode. So I would see that as being the classical historical counterpart. Yeah, so I have some of the same concerns as Carlo and David. Um, but I'm going to try to put my finger on them in a different way that might make the conversation go in a slightly different direction. Um, so I guess I'm worried that there's sort of like two. So I, I agree with you, first of all, that like as clusters of problem solving techniques and modeling techniques, finite field theory and what you call vacuum quantum field theory are kind of like different clusters of techniques. But it seems like there's also places where the two make contact with each other. And I worry that it's in that sort of space of contact or that there's a couple of different things that one might be doing that's gotten conflated here. Right? So one thing we might do, and apologies to that side of the room, we're modeling the entire universe, which is infinite. And we're thinking of like all these possible different sorts of boundary conditions for field systems on this universe. So, um, so I've got something like you know, a net of C star algebras or something else suitable across all space time. And I'm thinking about the dynamics of this thing, yada, yada, yada. One thing I can do is choose vacuum state and look at that sector. Another thing I can do is choose charge states and look at those sectors, or I can choose, I can choose PMS state and start looking at you know, thermal states of the universe in the situation. Um, and in that situation, if I'm looking at thermal states, maybe I apply some computational techniques from finite temperature field theory. Um, there's a separate thing I might do, which is take by universal quantum field theory and realize, oh, for computational reasons, it helps to wick rotate. And when I do that, now suddenly instead of having like a Minkowski theory or some other Lorentzian type theory, I've suddenly got this big Euclidean box with a field in it. And its thermodynamic statistical mechanical properties are somehow really interestingly correlated with whatever's going on over here in my Lorentzian box. Um, and so, but what's going on in that case strikes me as quite different, at least in many applications from the first case. Um, and that seemed to be one place where there was a bit of yeah, so I think, um, again, and so barring with the caveats that I might be just wrong about how to think about the temporal evolution here, I think the, uh, the, the one thing I was trying to emphasize there is that um, thinking about that, again, there are equivalent different ways of thinking about things, but the, the imaginary time formalism makes quite salient, or I thought made quite salient that you're not, you know, you, you've kind of gotten rid of time as, as, a, as a parameter in your theory. Um, Again, caveats to the questions over there. Um, I don't. I do think you're right. These are different sort of issues. Um, and and then there's so the, the way you describe it though also makes it uh, you know there's the thermodynamic properties of whatever's going on in the Euclidean box that might have interesting correlations to what's going on in the the, the thing that you think actually applies to the world. Um, I think that. The, the exact way you get from there to there is, a, I, I agree these are separate things and I didn't mean to conflate them, but I do think that's an interesting other other issue between them. Um, so yeah, I tried to talk, uh, I mean, I, I actually didn't go over them, but I had the number of unitarily equivalent representations, imaginary time forms, and it's like, those were meant to be separate things if I conflated them. But yeah, so, so if, sorry, was that, did I get it? What you were I think it's, partially, I still think there's sort of some, I, I think I agree with David here. I think there's a confusion about what's happening to the imaginary time parameter in the... Yeah. I, mean, I think that part of the issue is that if you look at the Euclidean theory, and then you think of equilibrium states, you essentially drop the time parameter. But if, if you had a time parameter in the Euclidean theory, it would be a, a, an additional dimension. So actually, you'd have like a five-dimensional <coughs> form. It's just that for these equilibrium circumstances, you can essentially quotient that out and just think about the four-dimensional box. Yeah, yeah, I, um, I, yeah, and I think that is a, that, that the modeling factor is an important 
I mean, again, we already we have the time search in the background. We think about how to the model. You know, we, we understand that we've just sort of suppressed the time parameter, but I think it's a term of a model that's still interesting. Okay, David has a finger on this, and then we'll get it. And we'll and just briefly, um, uh, one way to see, I think, that the imagining time is not being an issue here. If you want to do finite temperature perturbation theory in real time, knock yourself out. I mean, the perfectly good formalism to do it on the cast of space time. It's a bit of a nuisance. You end up doubling our fields. Um, so generally speaking, it's less hassle to do the imagining time version, but it's, it's perfectly available. Yeah, thank you. Um, I wanted to ask you a bit more about your comments on sort of the relation to the block universe picture, you, um, because I, I, I appreciate that you know there's not, not a block universe here in the sense that you're not trying to model the whole universe in one go. Um, but if you look at how people sort of propose how would you do physics in a block universe context, there's a lot of emphasis on you know modeling subsystems relative to other subsystems. And indeed, that's kind of the only thing you can do in a block picture because there's nothing else to describe things relative to. Um, so it sort of seems to me that what you're describing is, is not, you know, counter indicative to a block universe. It's kind of exactly what you'd expect to see in, in block universe physics, particularly in the case where you are imposing both final and initial boundary conditions. That looks like precisely this kind of technique of modeling one sort of subsystem relative to another within the block. Um, yeah. So I, 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 I think you're right that maybe it's not they're not like incompatible with one another. Uh, I, I think emphasizing the so I, I'm emphasizing the, the size and the epistemic axis. The world could be such, actually, I don't, I'm not super uh, well versed in the metaphysical debates here, but I think it's not incompatible to say that the, the world really is such, like it's a four dimensional block structure or something like that, and we live inside of it. I'm just emphasizing the fact that we live inside of it means that we have to pay attention to, to how we split these things up, and that that's a really important, relevant thing. Um, sometimes you hear some of these puzzles about, like, oh, if, you know, if we, if, we live in a four dimensional universe, there is no evolution, there is no time, like how do we make sense of our phenomenological experience of time, if that's the case, and I just, I think that's, that's where you're making the, the sort of category, or the, the mistake of thinking, we have an explanatory description that models the universe that way, but that doesn't, we still have to be embedded in that somehow, and we have to translate between, but I don't think it's, they're completely incompatible. Yeah, because I mean, I think the, the solution to the how do you make sense of time problem is precisely that you model things, your subsystems relative to other subsystems. Okay. So, yeah, I think that would, I don't, yeah, I don't think that's contradictory. Yeah, and just a thought on the cosmology. I mean, it, it, it sounds as if you, you were concerned that in the, oh, sorry, in the, in, the, in the cosmology case, then somehow it would be the whole universe and it got in the way of the general theme. I, I think it's less problematic than, than it looks there. I mean, I, I think we have to see finite temperature field theory applied to the early universe as still being applied to a little box. Um, it's in thermal compact of our little boxes. Um, and the tell is that it's on the encounter space time. I can't, I, I can't literally write down a thermal, a, a finite temperature field theory on, uh, you know, a Desitter surface or something, or, you know, early, early universe space time, because it's expanding and the, I don't have a time around it. What, what I'm going to assume is that, the, is that the time scale on which the geometry is changing is long compared to the time scale on which the system equilibrates. So I can, get, I can get away of pretending it's at equilibrium. Then I can model it in finite temperature field theory on a Minkowski background. Then I can get out an equation of state. Then I can plug the equation of state into the Einstein field equations. Then I can actually calculate the rate at which the temperature changes. And then I can do a consistency check um, and see whether I was right the temperature was changing slowly relative to the time scales. So I, th I think it's just as much in the, the general scheme you're, you're presenting as the more obviously finite cases. Yeah. Well, so I, I think I agree with you. One thing I'd say that makes it even simpler in some sense is that um, given this simple geometry of the early universe, I mean, you still have to make these arguments that you assume that the expansion rate is slow compared to the equilibration pattern, but you can, you can do just the equilibrium. You don't need to even do it in Minkowski space. You can do it strictly in Euclidean space, uh, like three, you know, three dimensional Euclidean space, and, and then just have your uh, the expansion parameter be correlated to the temperature parameter and make those, it's, if you assume it's an adiabatic change. Um, I, I worry, I guess, that, so I, I agree, but I worry a little bit, um, at least the way that some people try to make claims about, we do find temperature field theory, you know, assuming that there's an electroweak phase transition, as far as we know, it's got to be second order based on the parameters in the standard model. So that means it kind of happens everywhere all at once. And so if you want to make those, like it's not like bubbles that nucleate out, right? Like it's a slow, continuous sort of change. Um, 
I'm not, I, I, I'm not willing to argue against. Like, I still think that's the right way to think about it, but I need to, I, I'm worried about concerns like that. That's why I was thinking. Yeah. I mean, I defer to those who know better. I, I think it's still an open question whether the electoral transition is first order or continuous. Um, I, it, well, so it's open, I think, given that you, you have to have some beyond standard model physics to make it first order. I think given, as far as I'm aware, given it, the standard model, the constraints on it is that it would have to be second order, unless there's some beyond standard yeah. model physics, which, just much of which is ruled out uh, already. I, I can believe it. But, but I mean, look, no, just that it's, even though, I mean, even if in fact everything stays uniform, uh, I still need to check that. So I need to do things like check that inhomogeneities don't propagate the right kind of way. So yeah, I, yeah. I am going to, I think I am going to need the Minkowski bits if only to do that sanity. I better, I better check whether per, whether the degree to which perturbations spread out is going to damp on the right time scales. Um, but I think all, that, all that's fine. It's just it's going to be done by this kind of piecemeal model. Yeah, okay, yeah. It's, it's, yeah. Um, Okay, well, let's thank Adam.